yeah. I'm glad you guys are with us today. At the end of the service, we're going to pray over our students. We're going to talk. We're going to pray over our elementary students. We're going to go into middle school, high school, college. We're going to pray over teachers, administrators, professors, coaches. We're going to do all that. And then we're going to pray for parents. And all the parents said, hey, amen, I need some prayer. So we're going to do that today uh, before we launch into the school year. Uh, so I'm glad you're here today for this special service. Um, also, before we dive into the message, I want to just say, um, I, I, I am excited about our Healing and Prophetic Conference at the end of this month. Get online and sign up. We are excited about uh, the guests that we're going to have with us. Uh, Pastor Donnell Jones, Jim Critcher from Chantilly, uh, Virginia, Washington, D.C. area. You're going to love those. Donnell preaches here a lot. Um, and we're going to be just studying the Bible. What does it say about spiritual gifts? Paul tells us, don't be ignorant about the spiritual gifts. So this is a, one of our efforts to go, we don't want to be ignorant about this. What does the Bible have to say about it? We're setting aside a Friday night, Saturday morning, your registration. There's a cost for this. It covers your lunch, some of the expenses for the conference. I think it's 35 dollars students are ten dollars but I've been told that actually somebody has paid for all students to go so if you're a student yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but you got to register still so jump on board if you're a student we want you to come join us for that it's at the end of the month get online and that's what this uh, handouts for I want you to be there it's going to be a little a fun night um, also Jeremy Moore he leads worship at Freedom Church in Philadelphia he's coming as a special guest to lead worship we're gonna have a great time so I hope you'll join us um, turn in your Bible to Colossians 1. We're going to be in Colossians 1. And then maybe put your finger over in Genesis 1 and John 1. We're going th to be there in a moment. And I have a message for you today that is a continuation of our series, Preeminent Jesus. Uh, and we've been looking at who Jesus is. Uh, and here's what we discovered last week is that if Jesus isn't in the right place, nothing else will be. If Jesus isn't the right spot in your life, nothing else really will be. He is the cornerstone. He's the most important thing uh, that we got to get figured out. Because once you get Jesus figured out, then everything else begins to fall into place like dominoes. Like this is so vital. And we know about Jesus, right? We know that he was born in Bethlehem. We know that, that, uh, that there was Mary and Joseph. We know about that there was this resurrection from the dead. That's what we celebrate at Easter. So we've heard these facts about Jesus and his life. But who actually is he? It, was he a, a magician? Was he just a prophet? Was he a good guy that taught something 2,000 years ago? Like, who is he and what does that matter to us? And I'm going to propose to you it matters everything. And I'm going to, uh, over the course of this whole series, make the case that Jesus is much more than what most people understand him to be. As a matter of fact, um, Paul will make the case uh, in Colossians 1, 15 through 20, Jesus not only was much more and is much more, but that he actually himself believed him to be much more. Matter of fact, the Jewish leaders of his day crucified Jesus because he claimed to be much more than just a prophet. He claimed to be much more than just a good guy teaching some good stuff. He was much more than a miracle worker or some magician. No, no, Jesus claimed to be divine. He claimed to be God. And his disciples declared that he was in fact God. And this is exactly what Paul, after Paul is writing to the church, he greets them, he prays for them. And then he dives into, before we deal with all your issues, before we get to everything else, let's settle the issue of Jesus. And this is what he says, Colossians 1, 15 through 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Here uh, last week we talked about this first phrase, and we're trying to understand who Jesus is. So the first thing we learn is Jesus is the image of God. Everyone say image. That word image is, in the original, it's icon. He, Jesus is the icon of God. It's not some cheap copy, but he's the exact representation of God. The writer of Hebrews says he's the exact imprint of his nature. He's not something 
different. He is totally God, 100% God, 100% man. And we talked about that last week and how if that's true, if Jesus is God, then it changes everything about how we read his teachings and how we understand his life. Because when we look at Jesus' life, it tells us about God, how he interacted with the poor, how he interacted with the sick, how he dealt with religious leaders, how he dealt with those that were close to him, uh, what what kind of things he said about the world and about us and about humanity and about God. And so as he's talking, if this is, if he's the the image of God, it affects everything that we know and hear about Jesus. So this week though, Paul, I want to focus on the last half of this uh, first verse in 15 and then verse 16 and 17. And we learn two new things about Jesus. So write these down. If you're taking notes, here's the two new things we learn about Jesus here. The first one is this, Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. Secondly, Jesus is the creator and sustainer of all things. He's the creator and sustainer of all things. First, let's dive into that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. In Colossians 1 verse 15, it says he is the firstborn. This word firstborn is one of the most talked about, one of the most disputed words um, over 2,000 years of Christian church history. Um, This word has been argued and and been the cause of some splits within Christianity and and within uh, the tradition of following Jesus. And this word, uh, firstborn, is prototokos. Prototokos is the Greek word for firstborn. It's used in multiple other places and um, there's, a dis- dis- there, there's arguments about what this means. So there's many people that stand up and say what it means is firstborn, meaning first created, right? That, you know, it's just like I was the, the youngest in my family and my brother Ken was the oldest. So the firstborn means Ken. He, like the oldest, the oldest of the family, that's what it practically means, the first created. But then there's another stream of thought that says, no, it doesn't mean that. It actually means the first in superiority. It means number one in rank. It means first and foremost. It means preeminent. That's what it means. So when it's talking about that, so so this word in the Greek could go either way. And it's been used either way in, in that context. But there's another word that means first created that doesn't mean the other. So that was an option that Paul could have used, but he doesn't use that. He, he says, Prototokos. This is the word he uses. And this word, in the same context, is used elsewhere in Scripture. So whenever you don't know what something necessarily means, you kind of look everywhere else in the Bible to inform you. So here's, here's what we look. Exodus 4.22. Uh, this is the same word, but it's in Hebrew uh, as the New Testament was written. Exodus 4.22. God is speaking to Moses. And he's talking to Moses And he's telling Moses what to tell Pharaoh. And this is what God tells Moses to tell Pharaoh. Israel is my firstborn son. Let them go so that they may come and serve and worship me. This is what he tells him in Exodus 4. Now, here's what we know. Israel was not the first human. Uh, Abraham, Israel, Jacob, Isaac, those guys weren't the first humans to exist. We know that. The Bible doesn't even teach that. So there's no way that he's God's first created that God created others first, but they are his chosen people. They are his people that he's going to work through. Does this make sense? So that same word we see here means for sure that he's talking about preeminence or uh, rank. Uh, Psalm eighty nine twenty seven, talking about the Messiah, says, I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. Speaking of the Messiah, the coming G- Jesus who would become the Messiah, It talks about he's going to be the king of kings. He's going to be the firstborn. Well, Jesus wasn't the first king. There's lots of kings that existed before him. It can't be first created. Does this make sense? So, but the biggest one is in Hebrews 1.6. The writer of Hebrews is talking about Jesus and he's telling us all about Jesus and how amazing Jesus is and how different Jesus is from the angels, right? Because angels are created and, uh, And so we see this, Hebrews 1, 5 through 6 says, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, and today I've begotten you? Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, so this is the same word, let all God's angels worship him. 
Now here's what we know about the Bible. We know that the Bible doesn't allow, matter, matter of fact, it forbids for angels to worship anybody but God. Ain't the created things do not worship the creator of things. As a matter of fact, the, 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 the Ten Commandments and all that is all about, hey, getting things in order. We're to worship God. Don't worship the things he created, but worship the creator of things. And when you get that out of order, you get real messed up. And this was the, the author of Hebrews is in essence saying this very same thing, that, that how can Jesus be an angel if the angels are commanded to worship him? No, no, no. Jesus is not some just created thing. And I don't think it means first created. Now you go, okay, who messes this up? Because, you know, can you imagine uh, human beings messing something up? Um, it, it started early on. So in the fourth century, there's a guy named Arius. Everyone say Arius. Here's a cool picture of him. He looks awesome. Isn't that nice? His eyes are looking over to like, what's he looking at there? I do not know. This was obviously probably written after he was excommunicated from the church. And uh, so they wanted to show him as a little shifty guy. Um, he was a bishop. And uh, he lived at the time of Constantine. Uh, so Christianity had just become accepted in the official uh, religion of Rome. And Constantine was the emperor. And Arius uh, was a, a priest who basically said, hey, he saw this word, prototokos. He saw this word firstborn. He said, no, no, no. Well, that must mean Jesus was created. Jesus was created. So that means if Jesus was created, then he's under the Father. So the Father's above him, and then there's Jesus, and they're separate. They're unique and, and different, and they're not the, of the same substance. And as a result of that, it caused a stir within the church. And Constantine called a huge gathering at a place called Nicaea. And there in Nicaea, all the leaders and the church leaders and all the theologians, they came together and they said, hey, here's what the apostles taught. Here's what Jesus said. And they came out saying, with what they call the Nicene Creed, which basically is the, the Christian understanding of the Trinity. Uh, that they codified. It already existed, but they put it in writing that there's Father, Son, and Spirit, one God. The same substance, the same essence, but three persons. This is what they said. And, and they said, this is what Jesus said. This is what the disciples believed. And this is what the church is held to. And Arius didn't believe that. So Arius got the whole weird painting with the shifty eyes. See you later. You're out of here, right? And that's how th it began a split. And he was sent out. So this started back then. Some of you go, well, that's a long time ago. Does it still have effects today? Yes, because there was a few religions started in the 1800s here in America because we like to start stuff. Come on, America. We're entrepreneurial. We start businesses, religions, whatever, right? And so uh, we had Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness began uh, here in America around the 1800s. Both of them were really birthed out of Ar this thought from Arius, the idea that Jesus was not God himself, that he wasn't the same substance of God, that he was created by God. Matter of fact, the Mormons would even go on further and say he is one of a God or many gods, God's plural. Does this make sense? So, so this is the idea that, that, that is prominent, especially in Jehovah's Witness beliefs and teachings, that, that Jesus was, uh, what this means is that Jesus was created first. He must be created being, so he can't really be be God. But here's what we know from looking at the rest of Scripture, the Scriptures we just looked at, the firstborn prototokos here, the better understanding of it from all theologians throughout history and even still today, is that this word means that prototokos, firstborn means to precede the whole of creation. Meaning Jesus preceded all of creation and he is sovereign over creation. This is what firstborn means. It doesn't mean first created. And another primary reason we believe this is because the rest of what Paul wrote, and that leads us to our second thing about Jesus we need to know and confirms the first, that Jesus is the creator and sustainer of all things. Colossians 16 and 17 says, for by him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible, invisible, things uh, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, these are spiritual terms that are used in Ephesians and other places uh, to talk about uh, uh, angels and demons. All things were created through him and for him, for he is before all things and in him all things hold together. 
So Paul is not saying he's just the first created because he then goes on to say he created all things and existed before creation. How can both be true? No, no, no. What he means is he is preexist. He is superior. He is preeminent. He's number one in rank, but he also was there at creation. He was, everything was created by and through and for him. By him, he was the creator actively involved in it, but he actually, it was through him, he was the means of creation. And for him, all of creation, whether trees or mountains or human beings, are designed to bring him glory and to give Jesus glory. This was a big statement for Paul to write this church. Jesus is, and this was the hymn they were singing at the time, Jesus is the icon of God. Jesus is, in fact, the firstborn of all creation. He's preeminent. And Jesus is the creator and sustainer of all things. Well, is there any place else in Scripture that backs that up? Yes, tons of stuff. I'm, I'm glad you asked. Look at Genesis 1, 26. This is where Jesus, where God is creating the world, the account of creation. It says this. Then God said, let us. Everyone say us. Make man in our image, in our likeness. You know what I don't do? I don't talk like that. I don't come home from work and say, Kayla, today we did a lot of work in our office. And uh, we drove home. And then we had lunch with this and this and this. And she's like, who are you with? Well, I was by myself. Like that, that, that doesn't happen. The plurality here, we, us, God, the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit are there at the beginning of creation. What does this mean? It means that, that, that Christmas, when we celebrate the entrance of Jesus into our earth, into our world here, we're not celebrating his entrance into existence. We're celebrating God putting on human flesh and coming to be with us. He pre-existed creation. Jesus was around at the very beginning, creating and involved in creation. Uh, John got this. As a matter of fact, he, John opens this, opens his uh, l book in John 1, 1 through 5 in such a poetic way that mirrors G Genesis 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, here's what you need to know. When John is writing this in Greek thought, in Greek culture, the the word word there is logos and logos is kind of the concept or the philosophy that existed in the day that, that, um, that the, the logos was there before creation. Logos has always been, it's kind of like wisdom. It's kind of like logic. It's kind of like the force that existed before everything else was logos. As a matter of fact, you see in Proverbs, kind of playing with that idea, the writers of Proverbs talk about wisdom and personifies it as a woman. The wisdom existed long before. And so this is that same kind of idea in a Greek spin. But here is something crazy. What John is, John is using that kind of same language. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It just didn't pre-exist, but the word, this Logos was God. And then in verse 2, it says he. Everyone say he. So the, the Logos is no longer a philosophy or an idea, but it's a person. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And in him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not over. Come it. Who is he talking about here? Jesus. Jesus is the word. Jesus was there at the beginning. He was there before the beginning. He pre-existed creation. The word is personified and present at creation. And this Jesus is pre-existent eternally. He didn't just create, uh, he didn't just uh, create all things either, but he sustains all things. This is what's incredible. Is yes, he was there at creation, but he also sustains it all. What does that mean? It means gravity and the orbiting of planets and the, the air that we breathe and rain. Like everything that it brings life is, is, is Jesus sustaining that life. Remember that song? 
He's got the whole world in his hands. 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 Yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. Hey, that wasn't just a hit song. That wasn't just some, somebody getting a royalty. No, 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 no. That was based off a of truth. And here's the truth, that, that Jesus is sustaining the world. He just, God didn't just get the world up and running and get it sent off. No, 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 no. That he's, he is active and involved in the, susten, the sustaining of the world in which we live in the universe that he created. This is, this is really important for us to get because Paul, what Paul is claiming here is that uh, what sustains the world is not some uh, impersonal force, but a person. It's, it, what's sustaining the world is not some, some obscure philosophical idea, but it's the person, and not just any person, it's the resurrected Jesus. The one who came and put on human flesh, walked among us without sin, died on the cross like a, like a criminal, and then three days later rose from the dead with 500 witnesses acknowledging that as reality. Uh, this, is, this is incredible. The creator and sustainer of the world is not first created as Arius or Jehovah's Witness belief system states, but supreme over all creation because it was created by him, through him, and for him. Jesus is a bigger deal than you think. I was, um, 2019, I went to Africa and I was there doing some teaching and training with pastors and other leaders in our family of churches and had an incredible time. And after, after preaching on Sunday, one of the pastors said, hey, would you like to go on a safari? And I said, yes. Take me on a safari because, and I said, I don't want to kill anything because I only brought two bags and I can't take a giraffe home. You know, like that's going to be weird. It's, so it wasn't one of those safaris, just to go see stuff. And when we went to go see stuff, one of the coolest animals that I got to be real close to was a lion. And, and I took a picture of that lion. Matter of fact, it's right up here. There's the lion. And not to, to scar any of the children here, but that is some meat of a certain kind he's guarding, all right? I won't say what kind of meat. If you look close, you can tell. Um, and he's guarding that meat. And this lion had been eaten on this meat for a while, so it was a little lethargic. But what was interesting is I was a little closer than I felt comfortable with. But the closer you got and walked over to him where his meat was, he would kind of get aggressive. And he kind of looked cute, right? Like he looks kind of cute there. Like he's, he's a little angry, but he's like, you kind of still want to ride him. You know what I mean? Like that kid of you, you just want to jump on him and grab his mane and say, let's go. And you're like, woo, through the Sahara, you know? And I, that's, I don't know where the Sahara is, but if it, something like that. You want to like pet him, hear him purr. You could hear him purr. But then when somebody, one of, the, one of the guys we were with, we were with some ill-advised folks that do things that I would never do, like stick their hand through the cage to get a good picture. Like, what are you doing? And they would do that. He got, they got a little closer to his meat and he stood up and he roared. Roar! And everyone was like, oh! I mean, the roar, it was like it rattles your bones. You're like, this is crazy. And sometimes, maybe it's the way we grew up, maybe it's our culture, maybe it's the safety of America that we live in, we have pretty, we're real safe. I don't know, I don't know what exactly it is. Maybe it's the Sunday schools we grew up in and we sang Jesus loved me and John 3, 16 and all that is true and good. But let me just tell you, Jesus is more than just your friend. He is powerful. He is strong. He's the creator and sustainer of the world. And he is preeminent. Paul is telling us he's preeminent. He's ahead of all other things. Everybody, every power, every king, every emperor, everything that you think is powerful, everything you think that matters, all of it pales in comparison when the king roars. When he's the one who stands up and goes, oh, he's got the authority. He's got the power. He's over creation. He's sustaining it. And this is what Paul's telling them. It's what he's telling us today too. Jesus is bigger than you think. As much as he's your friend and he loves you, there's things in your life he didn't create you for. And when you begin to dive into those things, there's a roar that comes from Jesus that says, no, no. 
That's not what you were created for. That's not what I have for you. No, no, no. Jesus is above all and, and he is so much bigger than we realize. And this is important. It's important for us because too often when it comes to Jesus, we rush into how he relates with us, which is so loving and gentle. That's so true. But we fail to grasp how he is related to God the Father and who he is. And let me just tell you, I don't think you can fully get grace. You don't think you can fully get how much he loves you and his, how much his friendship matters when you don't fully understand how powerful and strong and the fact that Jesus is preeminent creator and sustainer of all things. And when we get that, everything changed. You go, Daniel, what are you talking about? What is this? How, how does this help me? Here, here's how it helps us. Here's what it deals with. This truth about Jesus confronts something. Here's what it confronts. It confronts idolatry. And you go, Daniel, like, well, that's great. But welcome to the 21st century. There's not a lot of idols unless you're like going to a Chinese food place. You know, there's like a Buddha. But I just kind of give him nuts and go eat the Kung Pao and I'm fine. You know, no big deal. But what you'll discover is the word idol in scripture is actually image or icon. So get this. God created humanity in his icon, in his image. In the image of God, he created male and female. And he created us to look like him. It says he created us in Genesis 1, 26. We already read it, that we would be like him, that we would look like him, that we would be his little image bearers, his little idols that would run around in the creation that he created, in the Eden that he created, which is, by the way, a temple. The temple is modeled after Eden. You have the temple, you have creation, you have God's little image bearers running around, partnering with him and what he's supposed to do. But then sin comes in and breaks everything. It breaks fellowship with God. It breaks relationship and, and sin separates us from God and separates us from our purpose. What is God going to do with his great creation? So what does he do? He sends his son. He himself comes into the world, into the temple that he created, if you will, and he sends someone who is the exact representation of his being, the very image of God in, in direct, that, that is him, not just a copy of him, but who he is. And he comes and lives among us without sin, and he dies on the cross, and he's rose from the grave all so that he could restore and begin to redeem God's good creation so that his presence can come and his image can be seen in you and me once again. Does this make sense? Uh, uh, what are you talking about idols? Well, idols are anything that take the place of God anything that take preeminence in our lives. Um, if you want to know if you have idols in your life, you need to just evaluate a few things. Number one, what do you spend your money on? Two, what do you spend your time on? Three, what has your affections and your thoughts? Where are they? With that understanding, we can see that Oftentimes, our biggest idol for most of us is self, S-E-L-F, self. We love ourselves. We think about ourselves. We're concerned about ourselves. We, 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 we give money to ourselves. I'm my favorite person to give money to. We, 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 we have our affections, our own feelings, our own desires. And I mean, in this selfie generation, who is not concerned with their self? Our desires, maybe it's our, our preferences are our, our God, whatever we like, whatever we don't like. Maybe it's our gender, our sex, or our ethnicity we elevate to that place. Maybe it's work. Work takes all of our affection, all of our time, all of our money. It just gobbles all of it up. Maybe it's your family. 
your family, you've loved family, you've believed God for it. And I love, you know, it's like, God, I just want you to break through with my family. I, I love them, but they, they take so much of your time and your attention and your affections. And they're elevated to a place where you, you put hope in your family. You draw, uh, you draw um, satisfaction and find identity in your family. Maybe it's in your kids or your grandkids or your spouse. And if that were to be taken from you, you wouldn't know who you are. You wouldn't know your identity at all. Why? Because they're, they're incredible, but they're misplaced. And what Paul is saying is nothing can be in the number one slot except for Jesus. Jesus is preeminent, which means first. He's the first in front of your spouse. He's first in front of your kids. He's first in front of your retirement. He's first in front of the making the team, hanging out with people that care about you, uh, that, that you want to love you at the dorm. He is number one. And nothing can be in front of him and before him. Money, stuff, family, work, good things, bad things, like even good stuff. Working for God, working for the church, working for a nonprofit, helping the community, all that's amazing. None of it should be number one. The only thing, when we get the number one thing right, Jesus, and he's on the throne, everything else makes sense. Because it was all, all of that stuff was created for him and by him and through him. And let me just tell you, all of them are bad gods. Your spouse is a bad God. Your kids are an awful God. Trust me. We're going to pray over them in a minute. They may be a little better, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Work is a terrible God. Work will take everything you have. I've never talked to a retired person that has a lot of money in the bank and said, do you wish you worked more? Nobody's ever said that. Nobody. Nobody. They regret not taking their faith more seriously. They regret the relationships they missed along the way. Nobody, nobody regrets. What, do you, what is the, what is, who has preeminence in your life? What has preeminence in your life? And this is what Paul's telling the church at Corinth, in, in Colossae. This is what he's telling you and I today too. Make sure Jesus is number one. Kids, say this with me. Jesus is number one. He's the number one thing in your life. That's right. And over the next several weeks, we're going to look at a couple more things, truths about Jesus and how it impacts our lives. Amen?